nominations, including the Academy Award winning A Beautiful Mind, <laughs> Oscar nominated Apollo 13, Frost Nixon, Something's Gotta Give, Air Force One, Jurassic Park, The American President, A Few Good Men, Backdraft, Misery, Ghost, When Harry Matt Sully, Damn. Mystic Pizza, Beetlejuice, Stand By Me, A Perfect Storm, to name a few. Most recently, she cast the soon-to-be-released Being Charlie and LBJ for Rob Reiner, and she just completed casting his new film entitled Shock and Awe, which will start shooting in October. In 2006, her book written with former casting partner, A Star is Found, Our Adventures Casting Some of Hollywood's Biggest Movies, was published and is enjoying continued success. Jane is a charter member of the Casting Society of America, as well as a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. In 1999, Jane and Janet were awarded the first Casting Director of the Year Award by the Hollywood Film Festival, and they have been the recipients of Arteus Awards for the casting of Parenthood, Harry Potter, and Home Alone. They have also received the Hoyt Bowers Award for Outstanding Achievement in Casting. Jane began her career in entertainment as an actress in New York City. Also moderating tonight's Q&A is producer Tova Leiter. Tova's credits include Glory with Denzel Washington, Oliver Stone's Nixon, Evita with Antonio Banderas and Madonna and Varsity Blues. Now will you please help me in welcoming tonight's very special guest, Jane Jenkins. Hello. There was so, some kind of piece of <laughs> casting in this movie. Is this right? uh, the first time most of you have seen this movie? Yeah. Where have you seen it? You've seen it before? <laughs> okay, how many of you have had the first time? Oh, a lot of you. Okay. Well, it was made before most of you were born. So that's probably why. We made it in 1987. So it's about to have its 30th anniversary. And Robin was 19 years old when she came into my office and we hired her. Wow. Yeah. She was so she's, beautiful. So she's done okay. Yeah. Well, that was, that was the thing, you know. We yes. needed, William Goldman wrote that Putter, Buttercup was the most beautiful girl in the world. Right. So I needed to find not just a beautiful actress, but an actress who incorporated all of that fairy tale stuff. Right. And one of the things that we discovered when we were casting was a lot of very pretty young models came in and then I started seeing some European girls and suddenly it just sounded better even though their acting wasn't all that great but not having an American accent sort of brought the fairy tale thing to life because America wasn't discovered yet in the time <laughs> of fairy tales. It's, it's just hard to and we started just asking actors to do this with any kind of an accent, make up an accent, any kind of, you know, an English accent, a French accent. And when I met Robin, I said, can you do some kind of accent? And she said, my stepfather is British. I do a pretty good British accent. I said, great, do that. And she read the lines and Buttercup came to life. Unbelievable. She yes. was the last girl that we saw after seeing almost 200 girls. She walked in, she said the lines. I went, oh my God. Yeah, please do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, uh, anybody's watching her on House of Cards? She's like Lady Macbeth. I mean, she's just so powerful and so dangerous and <laughs> terrific. She's she's yeah. a brilliant actress. And she survived the um, marriage to Sean Penn. So, <laughs> and and that, <laughs> and that. So, um, but all the other roles. I mean, even Billy Crystal at the end. It took me a minute. Did you guys know that it was Billy Crystal, yeah. the magic guy? Yeah. No, they don't know who Billy Crystal is. <laughs> And Andre the Giant, you had to go to some giant land to cast You him? know, that was the hardest part, needless to say, when I first sat down with Rob and Bill Goldman, and I said, so this giant guy, how, what, how, how big a giant? Like, how, what are we talking about? 
And Bill Goldman said, you know, like Andre the Giant. Does anybody know who Andre the Giant was? Because he still has a, a presence and there are posters and everything. But he was in a, pardon the pun, but he was an enormous wrestler at, at the time. So I, tr I, didn't ha I didn't have a clue as to who Andre the Giant was. And Bill <laughs> Goldman says, Andre the Giant, like I shouldn't, you know, like what do right. I follow wrestling? And <laughs> so I came back to my office and my partner's husband, Janet, ran the company for us and I said, who is Andre the Giant? He said, he's like the biggest wrestler out there. I said, well, how would I know this? So we tracked him down through the World Wide Wrestling <laughs> Federation, say that three times fast. Yes. And when I said that we were interested in him acting in the film and I gave them the dates, they said, oh, no, 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 he's going to be wrestling in Japan for millions of dollars and we're not canceling that. So then I started meeting giants. Now, that's a movie in itself because... <laughs> You meet all these enormously large people, but you know most people who are giants, it's a disease, and they're not necessarily graceful, and they're not necessarily healthy, and they're not necessarily the strongest people. They're just very large. And so I met an array of very interesting people, and we sort of didn't know what we were going to do. I mean, we went to London. I met this Scottish guy who was like the strongest man in the world who could pull, you know, tractor trailers with his yes. teeth and all. It was crazy. <laughs> and at the very last minute, <clears throat> we were in a casting session in London, and I got a phone call from my office in L.A. saying that Andre's dates in Japan were canceled, and if Rob wanted to meet him, he's flying from Brussels, which is where he lived, to Paris and then going someplace else, and maybe Rob could meet him at the Paris airport. And Rob... We dropped everything. We said, excuse me, to the actor who was auditioning. Rob and Andy <laughs> Scheinman got in a taxi cab, went to Heathrow, got on a plane, flew to Paris, met Andre, and Rob had tape recorded all of Andre's dialogue. And he met him in the, in the lounge, and he said, you have the job. Learn it exactly like that. <laughs> so all of those, hello, lady, this is all Rob <laughs> Reiner's interpretation as translated by Andre the Giant. And it was truly a miracle that at the last minute, because giants are hard to come by. <laughs> it, was, it was an amazing thing that he was available at the last minute. So um, how did you start in the business? I was not a successful actress. And I loved being in the business. And I worked as an assistant to a number of people and one of the two of the people that I worked for were John Peters and Barbara Streisand when, I, when they were making a movie called A Star Is Born, a remake of the original. And I sort of watched the whole casting process. And then I went to work for a man named Frank Peterson. I'm sorry, Frank Pearson. Yes. I got my Pearsons and Peertisons mixed up. Uh, Frank Pearson is, was a terrific writer. He wrote uh, a movie called Cool Hand Luke, Dog Day Afternoon. Right. He was a really fabulous Academy Award winning writer. And he wrote and directed A Star is Born. And after we finished shooting the, the film, he asked me if I would come and work for him on a film called King of the Gypsies. And so I did a lot of research for him, and then I watched them casting it, and I kept on saying, no, these people are wrong, they're not gypsies, because I knew a great deal about, more than I ever <laughs> needed to know about gypsies. Um, and literally a light bulb went off in my head, and I went, casting, what a great job that could be. It could really incorporate my acting and my production and all of that, and then all I needed to do was find a job, because I didn't know how to actually cast anything. There are <laughs> rules and regulations. And um, an actor by the name of Ralph Waite, who was on a very successful TV show called The Waltons, way back when, before all of you were born, um, was an old boyfriend of mine, and I asked him if he could help me get a job at Lorimar, the, the, the company that produced The Waltons. And he said, no, I'm going to do a movie, and you can cast it for me. And I went, I don't know how to actually cast. He said, go to the Screen Actors Guild and get the rule book. And I did, and I read it, and I figured out how to hire people. And I was just, it was the perfect culmination for me of my love of acting, my love of the movies. And literally, the minute I said casting, one door after another opened. And uh, 
Early on in my career, I hooked up with a wonderful woman named Jennifer Scholl, and she had worked for Francis Coppola, and then we all went over to Zoetrope and worked for Francis for a couple of years until the studio fell apart. But because we had been Francis's casting people, Rob Reiner called and said, I need a casting director. And so I cast Rob's very first movie after Spinal Tap, a film called The Sure Thing. And we just finished a, a film that he hasn't started shooting yet, but we just finished a film called Shock and Awe. And it's the 18th movie that I've done with Rob Reiner. So, I mean, and I've worked, and the same, the same is true for Ron Howard. You know, Ron called this studio and said, I need a casting director. And Fred Roos, who was Francis Coppola's producer, said, oh, just hire Jane and Janet. And so he did. And I've done, I don't know, 16, 17 movies for Ron as well. And it's just been truly the right, I was in the right place at the right time. So let me ask you, though, because you... You work with top directors, and they kept wanting to work with you. What is the quality in your work that made you so successful and desirable? Well, by them? I think I think it's a I think it's twofold. I come to everything that I do from an actor's point of view. I read a script from an actor's point of view because that's my training. I went to the high school of performing arts. I studied acting after performing arts with people like Bill Hickey and, and Uta Hagen at, uh, at HB Studios. So I read the script and interpret it, and then I sit down with the director and talk about what it is, you know, all of the, it's very easy to come up with a whole list of names, but what are the financial ramifications? How much money do we have for the film? How much money do we have for all of these people? And I think because I understood it from an acting point of view, it made it easier for me to make the leap into the production uh, part of it. And I think it was just a very, it, you know, casting is not a job that you go to school for. It's not like becoming a costume designer or an editor. It's a very intuitive job. And I think I just had a, a natural sense of how to do it. And, what the parts required, and who is going to bring it to life. Yeah. What um, one of the discoveries, and I don't know how it came about, was um, Julia Roberts was discovered in Mystic Pizza. Mm -hmm. how well, did you know, the, some, somebody else would argue that somebody else gave her her SAG card. Um, so I did not give her her SAG. She had done a couple of small things. She I know, a, but, but that role was, made her, you yeah. know, that was the break. Has anybody here ever seen or heard of Mystic Pizza? Probably not. Oh, a handful of people. Um, it's an interesting film, because when you look at it now, it's a very different Julia Roberts than the Julia Roberts that you see now. Um, or you because don't she see was anymore. also, because yeah. <laughs> she was also, eight, I think, eighteen or nineteen years old. You know, there was a time back in the eighties when all of these movies were being made that they were all made on very small budgets. I think Princess Bride was maybe ten million dollars. Uh, Mystic Pizza was certainly nowhere near that. It was probably right. six or seven million dollars. Maybe not. Yeah. And. We had the ability to find, because they were all, so many of them were teenage actors, <clears throat> we had the ability to find new young actors. Now, even when you're doing a teen movie, they want you to find that person who has some television presence, and maybe a couple of the other people can be new people, but it's much more difficult now because the movies are more expensive. And the competition to get them produced and out on a screen is, is much more difficult. Okay, I'd like to um, uh, open it up to the students to ask questions. Don't be shy. Whoever wants to ask questions, line up behind the uh, microphone. Yes. Nowadays, with electronic submissions, you guys are not getting hundreds, but sometimes even thousands of submissions. Thousands, actually, yes. So it's really, it's becoming increasingly hard to stand out from the crowd, but most importantly, it's becoming increasingly hard to build relationships with casting directors. So if you are an actress who just, just graduated from acting school, you have your headshots, you have your reel, you have representation, but you only have a couple of credits, 
and you're not being able to go into the right rooms, with all of your experience, how would you approach it? How would you... You know, it really has not changed. It is hard. It's very hard. It's always been hard. It always will be hard because if it was easy, then every jerk in the world would be doing this because it's so glamorous and exciting. But it is, it is hard. And I think that the most important thing that you can bring into the room once you get into the room is your confidence and your understanding of who you are and what you bring to the project. Getting into the room is very tricky and it's because you need an agent, especially out here in Los Angeles, you know, in the old days, and I don't even think it's so true anymore in New York, but it's a little easier in New York because people can sort of freelance between agents and you don't have to be exclusive to one agent. Here, nobody's gonna represent you unless it's an exclusive representation. And the only way to get an agent's attention is to do theater. Get into a theater company, do theater so that people have, so you have a place that you can work and people can see your work. Do student films so that you can st start to put a reel together. And you live in the age of the internet where you can put your own stuff together on YouTube and on other outlets so that there's a way for you to get seen, and people do get seen that this way. I mean, it is a new world, but it's true that when I put a breakdown out, within the space, I know that nobody's even read the words <laughs> that, you know, if it says, I just did a, a, a f this film for Rob, nobody actually read the entire paragraph that was the description. All they saw was male, 40 years old, boom. I had over a thousand submissions in less than 24 hours that you go through, go through. I mean, my, my favorite was last year we did a film called LBJ about Lyndon Johnson. And one of the roles that I was casting was for Robert Kennedy. There was a long description about how old he was at this point and who, what was going on. And I had agents who submitted, now, do we not know who Robert Kennedy was? But I had agents who submitted black actors, Latin actors, Asian <laughs> actors, dark haired actors. I mean, just, you know, so within minutes, they don't even read. They just saw, like, Robert Kennedy was a character's name, not a historical <laughs> figure. But so on my end, that's what I have to deal with. But on your end, just getting your face out there is, is a big challenge. And I think that the best way still to do it is to get involved in a theater company because agents and casting directors do go to theater all the time. Okay, thank you very much. Where are you from, by uh, the way? Colombia. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Princess my Bride pleasure. is one of my favorite films of all time. It's actually the film I watch when I'm sick. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, thank you. It's I don't watch it when I'm sick, but of all the movies that I've cast, this is my favorite. It really is. It, this, I just love it. Um, when we are here at, at NIFA and when you're learning about the business, a lot of emphasis is put on when you begin your career uh, branding yourself or going after certain type of types of roles or creating this stuff like more that. More than anything on the, on the face of the earth, you've become an actor so that you can become different personas. If you're Kim Kardashian, then God knows you need a brand <laughs> because there's nothing else there. There's no talent that's saleable. You're an actor. I don't, people are asking me this branding question all of the time. Are you planning on selling perfume or what is the brand? I don't even understand. This question makes me crazy. Thank I you. I'm glad to hear you, you say that. you have to be the best you that you can be. When I meet young actors or any actor who know who they are so that they have the ability to be 15 other people, that's what I'm looking for. You know, when you watch Meryl Streep, um, she always brings some portion of Meryl Streep to the party with her, but she has the ability to be 150 other people and plays them all. So what is her brand? Talent. 
is our brand. <laughs> I think that's the only brand that you need. I okay. don't understand this concept. Maybe, you know, if you're involved in reality television or I, I, I it's really beyond my comprehension, this whole conversation about branding. I think your brand is your talent and what you, your ability to interpret the script that you've been given and bring something interesting into the room. You know, the, one of the biggest mistakes that I see actors make when they come into audition, because you're only given the sides usually, but you can get the information for the rest of, of the movie. The script is by Screen Actor Guild Law, has to be available at your agent's office. It's, uh, you're, it's possible to read it. It's possible to call up the casting office and say, can I stop by and read it? I mean, we can't dole it out to everybody. Well, no, nowadays nobody doles anything out. It's right. all emailed. <laughs> but <clears throat> we don't usually email it to every actor that's coming in, but your agent should have a copy of the script. I think it's so important. What sets an interesting actor apart is the amount of preparation that they do for even the smallest parts. Because there's a guy named Bill Shakespeare who said, there are no small parts, only small actors. And I don't think a truer thing has ever been said. When an actor comes in and has really thought about how you're going to bring a character to life, who is this character? Where do they fit in the script? Who are you talking to? What are you talking about? And you bring a life into the room that fills up that character. I go, thank you very much, and I cancel 10 appointments because I don't need to bring 150 people in to see Rob Reiner. He doesn't want to see 150 people. That's my job to see the 150. I bring him five. And those five people are people that I feel really do have a chance to fulfill his vision of what he wants for this part. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jogo. I'm from the producing program here. I think the only non actor around. <laughs> um, my question is uh, nowadays, with uh, diversity became a very hot topic in, in, in Hollywood, mm -hmm. both in cinema and TV. Uh, and I don't want to be too controversial here, but the, all the polemics behind whitewashing and uh, Oscar so white early this year. How that change uh, your your job as a casting director? It still depends on on the script. You know, in LBJ, all of the people are all of the real people, and because we weren't dealing with the Martin Luther King aspect of LBJ's life, there were no. They were all based on real people. This movie that I just finished with Rob. Um, is also based on real people. It's a film called Shock and Awe, and it's about the lead up to the invasion of Iraq and a group of real reporters uh, who wrote for a news organization called Knight Ritter who kept writing articles about how there were no WMDs and stop this, stop this, stop this, and they were largely ignored. The only um, minority in ethnic casting are f a couple of fictitious um, parts that w the writer wrote into the script. So from a casting point of view, it's usually what's on the page, what the writer has created, unless there's an opportunity for me to say, um, just because the doctor was written as a 50-year-old white guy, what about if the doctor were a 40-year-old black woman or whatever, you know? so. The casting director can take that liberty and suggest, but ultimately it's the writer who has created this. And you know, the whole thing about Oscars So White, it isn't actors in the, the, the Academy works like this. Every branch does its own nomination. So the actors nominate other actors. The costume designers nominate costume designers. The editors nominate editors. There is not an Oscar for casting yet, um, so we don't get to nominate put anybody, but we do get to nominate the films. And when 
Each branch has culled it down to their five top choices for actors, editing, music, whatever the, 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 the department is. Then the entire membership votes on all of it. So it was the actors, you know, everybody was hysterical at the Academy, but the Academy doesn't nominate the actors. The Academy votes on the actors, but it is the actor branch that nominates the, the actors. And there's, I have no control over who they nominate. You know, I, I thought that there were people, every year I go through this, you know, the same thing about people that I would nominate and people who get nominated. And the two don't always mesh. But I think that we live in a diverse world and I think it's a great thing that people are opening up their eyes to the world that we live in. Part of the problem, I think, has always been that the majority of scripts are written by white men. And so women are not always included in positions of authority as doctors, as lawyers, as whatever. Uh, ethnic minorities are not always included. And that's not the world that we live in. So I think that all of this hubbub has been very fruitful in casting a, a wider shadow uh, across the, the spectrum that is the United States of America and the world that we live in. So I think it's, all, it's ultimately a really good thing. Okay. Thank you. I absolutely love The Princess Bride. <laughs> My dad told me about it when I was a kid. And at first, I didn't want to watch it because I was like that little kid in the movie who thought I was lame from the title. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. I wanted to ask you, like, do you get a choice on what movies you get to cast and what really, like, attracts you to a certain movie? Well, I get a choice as to when a movie is offered to me, if I say yes or no to it. There are a couple of movies that I turned down in my life that I go, what was I thinking about? And then there's some that I really don't <laughs> regret turning down. So it's not so much a cho choice. You know, I need a job, I need a job, I need a job. And just like a lot of actors, aren't always in a position to turn down parts. But if there are things that I find, I have to say the dialogue all day long when I'm auditioning actors. And if it's a script that I find really objectionable that I will never go see in my life, <laughs> that I just can't go home and go to sleep and you know not take a bath before I do, <laughs> then I'll, I, I turn that down. But you know there are times that you need a job and you have you know I used to keep an office. I no longer keep an office, so it makes it a little easier. But I used to have an office and had people working for me and had a telephone bill to pay and a Xerox machine to pay for and insurance and all those things that you have when you run an office. So there were, you know, films that I cast that I can't say are at the top of my all-time favorite list. <laughs> but I, I was in a very, 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 I can't stress it enough, fortunate position in that I hooked up with two young guys who were not famous filmmakers when I first worked with them, Rob, be, between Rob Reiner and, and Ron Howard, um, and my partner Janet did a young Chris Columbus's early movies, so that we, we worked with these guys when they were starting out on their first films. We clicked, we did a good job, they hired us again and again and again, and I was very fortunate, and because I had that sort of to count on that, you know, nothing is guaranteed, but pretty much they were going to do a movie every year, year and yeah. a half. It gave us the ability to say no to pictures that we found. You know, we were two women running a company and there were scripts that I went, I I'm sorry, this is just degrading and I'm not going to do it. Somebody else did it, but, you know, I think that, and I think that's true as, as actors, you know, there are scripts that involve, you know, sexual activity and rape and the victim and the, if it's something that you feel that you can't do in good conscience, just say thank you very much, but it's not for me. Nobody's going to, you know, not ever see you again. You can't do things that, you have to live with this stuff for the rest of your life. And so I feel that I'm very, very fortunate in that I've worked with some really good guys on some really terrific movies. It was just, I just got lucky. Thank you.
but speaking of the Princess Bride, if anybody can find the book that Bill Goldman, this is based on a book that goes off on all these other tangents that the movie just couldn't because we'd still be watching. But if you can find the book, it is the funniest laugh out loud rolling on the floor book that you'll ever read in, in, in your life. It's just fabulous. It's a great book. Which reminds me, tell us about your book, the one you wrote My with book. Janet. I wrote a book a number of years ago, and I, I did not bring one to, tonight. I, you know, it's, you can find it on on Amazon, and I, I no longer have. I actually I buy them on Amazon and to give them out. Um, <laughs> but we wrote a book a number of years ago, and I, actually ten years ago, called um, "A Star Is Found," all about the the movies that we've cast and how we found Julia Roberts and how we wound up casting Robin in this and. All of, all of those experience. And there's a lot of insight. Um, I think it's a really valuable book for actors in terms of what goes on in a casting office and how some of these decisions get made. Be how many of you are actors here? The majority of everybody. And how many of you have started going out to audition for things? So here's the most important thing that you need to know about an audition. An audition is not about getting a job. An audition is about presenting yourself to the people that you hope will hire you in the future. If you can get the final result, you know, just like in acting, you don't, you can't, you can't act the final result. You have to be in the moment. You have to be in the moment when you come in for an audition. And that'll take away all those nerves that make you hyperventilate so that you can't think and you can't speak. Just be there. Just come in and let somebody know who you are, what you have to offer. You're either going to be right for the part, in which case you'll get a call back, but you may not get the job, or you're not going to be right for the part, in which case I make a little note going, very interesting. And, and I keep it in the back of my mind for the next time I'm working on something, and I go, oh, remember that kid that came in, or blah, blah. I mean, casting directors keep all of these ridiculous notes and, and you remember, we remember the people who really made a deep impression on us, not because they got the job, just because they were terrific. And that's all you have to worry about when you come, come in prepared and come in and be who you are. Don't come in trying to be something that you're not. Hi, my name is Kirillo. Thank, thank you very much for coming today. My question is, what are the most common mistakes that actors make on the audition? Well, I think that not being really prepared, not th thinking that just because it's a couple of lines, oh, anybody can do this. But every human being has some unique characteristics, and I'm looking for what kind of interesting life you're bringing into the room with you that's going to add to this movie. It's sort of like, you know, weaving a tapestry in a way. And even though there are small parts, I'm looking for that little gold thread that you go, oh, what was that? That's, so for me, there really are no small parts. They're all important. Years ago, um, Janet and I both cast I don't know, about 14 movies for John Hughes, who paid us really one of the greatest compliments, saying that he loves working with us because even the pizza guy brings something to the whole movie. <laughs> and that's what I'm looking for, you know? When I go back and look at actors that were in movies that I did early on who have become successful actors, you know, when, uh, when Matt Damon and, and Ben Affleck right. won their Academy Award for writing um, the, the... Good Will Thank you. Some reporter called me up because the very first, if you look at Matt Damon's IMDb, the first movie that he's in is a movie called Mystic Pizza. And this reporter called me up and said, did you have a sense when you hired him for Mystic Pizza that he had this in him? And I went... Is this like a joke question? I said, no, of course not. What I knew was that he was the best 16-year-old kid who lived in Boston who looked like the guy who was playing Julia Roberts' boyfriend, and he was his younger brother. 
That's what he, he, you know, because Ben Affleck came in and auditioned for the same part, but Ben didn't fit into the family. So it's not that I had, you know, any ESP that he was going to turn into anything. What he was was he was the perfect kid who looked like he fit into this, you know, family. And when you go back and you look at all of these people who have gone on to successful careers, it's incredibly satisfying from the casting. But I'm looking for somebody who brings in authenticity and preparation and hopefully fits into the family that I'm casting. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was wondering how important you think a good quality reel is. I think it's very important. Um, it's, it's important because it's very hard to get an agent without a reel, but it's also very hard to get a real good, a real reel. Uh, I don't want to see, I'd rather see little snippets of stuff that you've done professionally or a student film so that it's not just a video camera shooting your monologue in sort of dead space. Um, I think that, you know, we all live in this era of everybody's got a, a video camera with them at all times in, ter in, in terms of their phone. You have to learn how to be a bit of a filmmaker. And if you're going to do a video because you don't have professional footage, then you really have to learn how to like yourself or have somebody like you and do this in a way that I can see you in a movie, not just in a blank background, shot from a distance. I want to see a close-up. I want to see the intimacy that film offers and what kind of, what you're bringing to it. So a, a reel is very important, but there are ways to accomplish putting a reel together when you haven't gotten a, a whole body of work that you have professional quality uh, stuff on it. Thank you. I mean, you're in a film school. All You should all be making films of each other. True. You don't have to clap after every answer. It's okay. <laughs> um, hi, my name is George, and um, I do filmmaking and acting. Um, so, you know, sometimes I think performance can really um, shape a movie. And as a, as a student filmmaker, we don't have, like, a casting director. And so we cast ourselves. Um, the thing is, um, I was wondering if you can offer us one piece of advice, what would it be when, when it comes to casting? Well, it's the, same, it, it's the same thing that I'm, you're looking for somebody as a filmmaker, you're looking for the best possible actor that you can find that embodies the character that is in the script that you've either written or you're filming or you're directing or whatever you're doing with it. And you have to go through that same process. I mean, I meet a whole bunch of actors. I meet 40, 50, 60 people who are not really perfect. And then I meet five that I go, wow, any one of these people could be sensational. And then fortunately, it's up to the director to pick the one. So I do the same thing. I mean, literally when we did The Princess Bride, I met at least 200 very pretty young actresses and then Robin, and, and a number of them were pretty good. And then Robin Wright walked into my office and brought this whole, I mean, it was just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So that's, you're looking for the person that really encapsulates what you want that is going to spark your creativity and bring the whole movie together. And you may have to see a lot of people to find the one that brings with them what you need, and as a director and as a filmmaker, what you can help them achieve because the quality that they have, some essence of who they are, is right for the project. But, you know, realistically, sometimes you might get actors that are very good, but mm -hmm. they might not necessarily fit the characters. Well, that's, but you also get characters that fit the role, but, you know. I go through the same exact thing. <laughs> All right, thank it's, you. There's not, there's not, I go through the same exact thing. There's not an easy way. I see dozens and dozens and dozens of actors before I 
select the couple that I bring back to the director. And that's, uh, you know, you can also cast a little further afield outside. I would imagine that if you put an ad in backstage as a student filmmaker, there are always young actors looking to get a reel together. So I don't know that you have to be limited to just, you know, so if you need a 50-year-old principal of a school, you may not find it among your student body. But I wouldn't be surprised if you put a, a, an ad in backstage, if you can, I don't know if you're allowed to do that here, yeah. but you might be able to find somebody more appropriate than from the student body. Cool. Uh, thank you. Can I just ask one more question? Sure. sure. All right. <laughs> so like, for example, you get five people, right, for your final choice for like mm -hmm. a certain character. And so to say one gets the role and so the other four would just leave. But like... Would, as a casting director, will you talk to the director and say, hey, I think these four people are really good, so we should... Uh, I wouldn't you know. be bringing these people in if I didn't think that they were really all capable of being the part. But ultimately, it's the director who makes that... I mean, we just went through this. The, there's a part in this new movie, and early on, there was a young actor who came in and is absolutely sensational. And Rob tends to, there's a very funny story about Freddie Savage that I'll tell you in a second, but Rob tends to be very enthusiastic. And I said, do not offer him the job in the room because there are several other people who are not here today that I want you to see before you make a final decision. So he kept talking about this guy, talking about this guy. And then there was, a, there were, there were 10 actors. I, it was the most number of actors that I brought to him in, in quite some time, but there were 10 really terrific young guys. And then there was a kid who just graduated from uh, American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and he, you know, did the, st the student league auditions, and an agent picked him up, and he taped the scene. I didn't bring him in. She taped him in her office. She sent me the tape, and I went, whoa, what was that? And I had him come in and read for me, and I brought him in for Rob, and then it was a really hard choice between the kid who just graduated, who we are hiring, and this other kid who was also sensational. But there was just this sweetness and sympathetic thing to this other kid that is going to work better for the film in, in the long run. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to forget who the other, you know, Here's sort of, I, I always use Meg Ryan, even though she's no longer an, an operable star. She's not a big star at the moment. But I first met Meg Ryan when she was 18 years old, and I was casting Rob's first film called The Sure Thing. Has anybody ever seen The Sure Thing? You are a real film buff. Um, <laughs> you've just watched all of my films. But... The Sure Thing was John Cusack's first big breakout movie, and there was about a young college bunch of kids. Meg Ryan was hysterically funny, absolutely adorable, really talented, really terrific. I brought her back in for Rob. He said, she's terrific. Not the right girl, but she's terrific. And we did not hire her. And then two years later, we're doing The Princess Bride, and Meg comes in and she reads for The Princess Bride. And Rob says to me, God, if Bill Golden wrote that Buttercup should be the most adorable girl in the world, I would hire her right now. But I need the most beautiful girl in the world. Keep looking. And Meg was not ugly by any means. Um, and then two years after that, we were doing this movie called When Harry Met Sally. And Meg Ryan was the second girl that came in to audition. And Rob said, it's her part. Cancel everybody else. So in that six or seven year period, Meg auditioned for a bajillion things. There were two jobs that we gave her in movies that were not enormously successful movies, nor did they catapult her career. But the point is that she was absolutely fabulous the very first time I met her when she was 18 years old. And that's why I remembered her and kept bringing her in and bringing her in and whether I cast her in something like When Harry Met Sally that catapulted her career or somebody else did. It was clear to me that at some point this girl, the opportunity and this actress were going to meet up 
because that's what it takes. It takes the opportunity and the right actress for that explosion to happen. Thank you, and thank you very much for coming. I'm Nick Hagen. Um, I'm a directing student here, but I'm more specializing in production design. Um, is there any social media that younger or any actors should stay away from for marketing reasons? You know, I am not personally into the whole social media thing, but I do understand the importance of it. The, and I think that the most important thing, obviously, is to remember that whatever you put out on social media is going to haunt you for the rest of your life. So take yes. that <laughs> wisely and, and use, I mean, I think that there, there is obviously value. There isn't personally to me, I don't look at anybody's Facebook or Twitter or whatever. I don't care, could not care less, but I'm old school and I do it the old way. But all of my former assistants who are now successful casting directors who are, you know, less than half my age, are all into social media and it does have a presence and it does have a, a place in all of this. You know, I, I think that it's unfortunate that so much of it is used anonymously to be, you know, nasty about people, how they, you know, all, all of that. <laughs> well, thank you. So I'm gonna use this opportunity for one more question. Uh, uh -huh. We hear a lot about uh, the director picking the last, but also here sometimes the producer, well, we got a producer it here. It depends. So it, how does if, if the director is Rob Reiner, mm -hmm. and I sit in a room with him, he says, that's the person I want to hire. If the director is not as successful or proven as Rob Reiner, or in television, because in television, the director is not always on the show every single week. A lot of directors rotate, and they're not around the week before, the two weeks before their sh segment shoots for the casting, so the producer will make that decision. Or if you're a young new director who's been given this opportunity, the, direct, the, the producer and the studio will wind up making the final decision. Have you ever been in a situation of conflict that you had to be the tiebreaker? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. And there have been times when I thought a director was making a mistake and, you know, I said, are you sure that this is what you want to do? But ultimately, my job is to fulfill a director's point of view, not my point of view. I can sort of wrestle a director to the ground a little bit to say, come on. You know, when we were casting the movie um, Ghost, you know, the movie Ghost, Literally, when I read the script, I said, oh, they must have hired Whoopi Goldberg already. <laughs> I don't know who anybody else is, but this part seems to have been written with Whoopi Goldberg in mind. And I had never worked for Jerry Zucker, nor had I ever met him. And so Janet and I, you know, because the casting director kind of has to audition for the job as well. You go in, you have a meeting about blah, 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 blah. And I said, so hey, did you already hire Whoopi Goldberg? I mean, did you, did you write? And Joel, the writer was, Joel Rubin, the writer was there. I said, did you write this with Whoopi? And Jerry said, no, we thought about Whoopi Goldberg, but I'd like to see who else is out there. And I went, why? I mean, <laughs> that's like the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And... I literally saw, literally saw something like 230 people. You name a black actress from Tina Turner to Nell Carter to Alfre Woodard. I mean, people who were famous, people who were not famous, people who were on Broadway in New York. Hundreds of actors came in to read for the part that would be ultimately played. And after every single person, Jerry would say, no, it's not them. And I would say, so what about Whoopi Goldberg? Don't you think? I mean, I think she was like born to play this part. Have you ever seen her Broadway show that was on HBO? And we kept going and going and going. And at some point early on in the whole proceeding, Whoopi came in for a meet because she was already a big star. So she doesn't come into audition, but she came in to meet with Jerry. And she said, I would love a shot at this part. And we said, oh, okay, thank you very much. And Jerry said, well, we know she's there, but you keep looking. And I kept <laughs> looking and I'd bring in actors. And then one day he gave me a list of like 10 actresses that friends of his had given him names of. And I said, Jerry, you've already met every one of those people. And he said, oh. I said, so what about Whoopi Goldberg? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and eventually what happened was when Patrick got hired, who they did not want for the movie either, um, but finally Patrick actually came in and because nobody wanted Patrick Swayze for the part. And Patrick said, I really want this movie. And he came in and he, he had already done Dirty Dancing. He was a big star. And Patrick came in and read and he and I said, it's one of my most treasured moments because I, we hired Patrick my partner Janet had put Patrick Swayze in his and her very first movie, something called Casey's Shadow. No, not Casey's Shadow, a thing called Skate Town USA. And then we hired him for The Outsiders and we hired him for Grandview USA and we hired him for Red Dawn. So I knew Patrick really well. And Patrick and I sat on a couch in the director's office and read all the scenes until he says, I love you, and she says, ditto, and... <laughs> One of the producers who really did not want Patrick was in the back of the office with tears running down her cheeks, and Jerry said that was fabulous. So now we had Patrick finally, and they turn to Patrick and they say, what do you think about Whoopi Goldberg? And Patrick says, she'd be great. <laughs> and even though he said she'd be great, Patrick and Jerry, she was shooting a film in North or South Carolina someplace. She was shooting a film with Sissy Spacek. They got on a plane and they went to North Carolina, the two of them, Patrick and, and Jerry. And Patrick and, and Whoopi did the scene, from what I understand, because we didn't videotape everything back then, they did the scene in the first class lounge at the, at the airport. And then Patrick and Jerry came back on the next flight and Jerry said, well, she was great. I don't know what I was thinking. She's perfect. <laughs> but it took me months. I was very thin, though. I lost a lot of weight <laughs> on that movie. <laughs> but, I mean, sometimes you can, you can persist with a director, and at some point, if Jerry said finally, no, 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 Whoopi Goldberg, I'd have to come up with another actress. But fortunately, he caved, and she won an Academy Award. You know, there's just no way of knowing. Uh, yeah, um, what happened to me on one movie is that um, the director wanted somebody and uh, I liked somebody and the casting director liked somebody, so we filmed them. Mm -hmm. Filmed them and then we showed it to the studio. And the interesting thing that happened is that, that the actor that we loved in the room didn't hold up on the film. It came on like a soap opera actor. <laughs> and the actor, who was very kind of reserved, didn't show much in the room, on the film was sensitive, mm -hmm. sympathetic, you know? And you know in, the, in the old days, we used to do serious screen tests. And sometimes they would, not just video, they would film it, they would hire a stage, yes. they would do all, you know, have makeup, they would do a whole thing. Nowadays, we videotape everything, but there really is a difference. And because ultimately your, the final product is going to be on film, for actors, learning how to talk to that camera is really, really important. If, if whatever you are saying is honest and true, the camera can read your mind. You don't have to say a word, and it can be heartbreaking, or it can be really funny, because whatever is going on inside your head, if it's coming from a real place, the camera sees it. And you don't have to, you know, you can keep it real. It's not like doing theater where you have to project all the way out to the, you know, balcony and everybody needs to hear you. So there's always a little heightened sense of reality in theater. But in film, it can be so small, so intimate, so honest that it's incredibly powerful. And I always say to actors, don't let the acting show. Keep it simple, keep it honest, keep it real. Just say the words, just speak. That's all you have to do. You don't have to be a big dramatic thing. People don't act like that, <laughs> except in soap operas. <laughs> or in political uh, campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but was, even that's coming, I mean, you couldn't make up. Yes. You couldn't make up what was happening in the two, con I mean, you couldn't make it up. It all came from a real honest place, <laughs> which is 
all the more scary. <laughs> Unless you haven't figured out my political conviction. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, based on exactly what we're talking about right now, uh, because of the the world, you know, switching to more social media, and you know, you have LA casting and you know, casting networks and stuff like that. The your headshot and whatever picture you send in obviously is a really, really important. important. It's a very important calling card. And they say that you know you, you can either send ones in for you know like a specific role you're trying to go after, or you just send one in, in yourself, and they'll you know we have two sides that one really thinks it's only this way, and one really thinks it's only that way. From your view, well, because people make snap judgments just on based on what we all look like. You know, you come into the room and somebody already says. You're a truck driver. You're a doctor. Right. What you know, whatever it is that my perception is, and that's impossible. I think it's very important for actors to have one shot that just looks like who they are on a good day. You know, it doesn't have to be glamorous. Well, there are days that you don't <laughs> want your pictures taken. It doesn't have to be glamorous. I mean, I think it's harder for the women. Is your hair up? Is your hair down? How much makeup? Keep it simple. Just, I want to see who you are. I want to see what's going on in your eyes. I don't want to see some glamour glamour shot that's all whited out that I can't see anything about who you, I want to see the texture of the human being. And then it doesn't hurt to have a couple of other pictures in your motorcycle gear or in, you know, whatever that shows other sides of, of you. But what you do need is one good picture that really captures the essence of who you are. I want to see a light in somebody's eyes. I want to know that somebody has some thought. They're not just sitting there vacuously taking um, the, uh, a picture with nothing going on. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Anna. I just wanted to ask, you said like if we want to get an agent, we have to go to like theater. How do we get a theatrical agent? Well, by doing, by doing, I mean, they need to see, you know, I think the days of coming into agent's office and doing monologues or doing a scene are long gone. In my day, when I was an actor in New York, that's what you did. You got into an agent's office, you either did your little monologue or you brought a scene partner in and you did a scene in the office and they either signed you or they didn't sign you. Nowadays, nobody does that. And unless you can be in a theater production, there's no way for them to see you. So there are a bajillion small theater companies in Los Angeles. And get involved, get into audition for every one of them so that you can get into a play and you can send out you know, the information to every agent in the agent's book, come and see me. And, if five of them show up, consider yourself lucky. And if one of them likes you, then it's a miracle. I mean, it is that hard. You have all chosen to be in an extraordinarily difficult and competitive business in case you weren't aware of that. And I'm sure nobody's mother in this room twisted your arm saying, darling, please <laughs> go into show business. <laughs> Certainly my mother didn't. She begged me, begged me not to. but. I, I loved all of this. I loved the theater. I loved, you know, I grew up in New York seeing plays from the time of my, my it's all my mother's fault. She took me to see my first big Broadway show when I was seven years old. I, I was like, it was the most incredible thing I had ever seen in my life. And I, because I grew up in New York, I saw some amazing, amazing, amazing performances growing up in New York. You know, I just was lucky that I found another route so that I didn't have to go through, you know, suffering the slings and arrows of being an actor. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to expand on the on the headshot. When it comes to the reel, um, what what are, do you what do you want to see in a good reel? What makes a good? I want to see some a variety of of parts that you can play, um, and, and and keep it simple and honest. I just want to see good work. That's all I want to see. It doesn't have to be 15 different scenes. I want to see a couple of things that are simple and honest and real. I want to see that there is a real actor showing me what they can do. 
and you don't have to be, you know, I, I always tell actors, go to documentaries, watch documentaries, watch newsreel footage, watch how real people really behave. You know, there have been all these horrible fires and you watch people with some, you know, crazy reporter saying, and how do you feel is you've just lost your house? People, I, actors go, oh my God, oh my. Well, people don't act like that. People are in such a state of shock that they just stand there saying, I just, I, 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 I've lost everything. I've, there's nothing, there's nothing. And, and the honesty and the simplicity of how, the depth of how they feel, they don't have to be hysterical. I know that they must be hysterical inside. But the shock of what they've just lost or their horse, you know, I, on, on, on NPR the other day, I was listening to a woman who had to have, she had horses and the, the, she, the horse wouldn't get into the trailer and somebody rescued the horse and the vet called her and said, the horse is not injured, but he's not going to recover. And she had to give the vet permission to put the horse down. I mean, just listening to her explain, I wasn't, I didn't even have the visual, just listening to her explain how she had to let go of her horse and give the vet permission was heartbreaking. I mean, you could hear it in her voice because there was no acting. She was talking from her heart. And that's all that acting is. If you, if you make it honest and simple and real, it's so much more effective than histrionics. Even, even when people are playing over the top parts, it has to come from a real place, otherwise it's all just bullshit, you know? And that's never effective, is sort of how I feel, so. It reminds me on the show's date night where husband and wife usually murder each other. <laughs> And uh, whenever the husband calls and says, oh, my God, oh, my God, my wife, I just came home, and she's mad, da, 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 da. I say, okay, you murdered her, mm -hmm. because it's so over the top, and it's so not what really... <laughs> it's, not what, it's not what happens in real life. And I think it's incredibly valuable watching documentaries about you know, real, real stuff. It's... Okay, now I'm tired, and I want to go home. <laughs> So, um, once again, unless there's a burning question, last burning question, I would say, let's say, good night. I have learned something. I don't know about you, but I learned something tonight. Thank you very much, everybody.